How's everybody doing today? How many are ready for Thanksgiving? Don't you wish it could be Thanksgiving every week? That would be, <laughs> be fantastic. Uh, just wanted to bring you up to speed on a really important day that's coming up, and that is that uh, on Sunday, December the 2nd, our congregation membership will be voting regarding improving a mortgage for our expansion project. Uh, according to our constitution and bylaws, that decision is not made by myself or our church council. That decision is made by our church membership. So if you remember, you will, you will have an opportunity at any time during any of the services that day to register at the welcome desk, to pick up your ballot and cast it at any time. We know that there may be some folks who have some additional questions, would like some additional information. And so at the uh, following the third service on that day, we will have a meeting for anyone that wants additional information. And we'll do our best to answer the questions that you have. And uh, we think that there's wisdom in a process so that the decision is made collectively and, and not just by an individual or a small group. So I hope that you'll be able to join us on that day. So uh, you, you did hear uh, about uh, a wedding yesterday, and uh, the concept there is, is a covenant. Uh, we're going to look at a really intriguing passage of Scripture today, and I actually don't have time to read all of the story. I'm going to read a portion of it and then refer back to some things that you can find in the previous chapter. But in Joshua chapter 10, it says, Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces. And they moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. And the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord then said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise, and the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them down all the way to Azekah and to Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself of its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down out a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to, the human, to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. And then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. It's a really complicated story and even more complicated than, than we read. Uh, Stephen talked about the wedding was at, uh, yesterday uh, I, I did a wedding a few years ago for a couple. They'd actually been living together for quite a few years. They had a son together, and that son was double-digit age and was actually the best man in the wedding. And all through the premarital counseling, the guy would just look at me and say, it's not a big deal. It's just a piece of paper. Nothing's going to change. So we went through all the premarital and it was a location wedding. It was up on the, the shores of Lake Ontario. It was a beautiful setting, a beautiful day. And I got there. When I got there, he's, he's pacing back and forth. His coat is off. He's sweating profusely. He's having difficulty breathing. And, and I said, are you all right? And he says, I do not know what this is. I said, I do. And he said, what? I said, it's because this is more than a piece of paper. <laughs> like, this is a really big deal. And you are finally coming to grips with the gravity of the promise that you are making today. So, cowboy up, cupcake, and go stand in front of the room. I have the spiritual gift of encouragement, so I, 
I occasionally do that. And, uh, and he went up and made his promises, and they have been happily married since. The idea of, of covenant, it's, it's embedded into the story, and it's easy for us to miss. Um, let me give you a little history. What had happened is, in the previous chapter 9, Israel has now crossed into Canaan, and they're beginning their conquest of the land. They had a spectacular, miraculous victory at Jericho, but their next engagement, militarily-wise, didn't go well for them. They lost at Ai. And uh, they regrouped, uh, went back and did experience victory there. And now what's happened is a number of kings from the region around of these nation states have decided that Israel's too strong. If they could defeat Jericho, their cities are not near strong enough to withstand them. And so they decide that if they form an alliance, then they combine their armies and bring them into a coalition, they could be able to massacre the Israelites. And that's their intent. There's one nation state that decides not to participate in that plan, and that's Gibeon. What Gibeon decides is that they want to have their own treaty with Israel, but they know that Israel is intent on possessing the land, so they develop a strategy of deception, and they worked it to a T. What they did was is that they got some worn-out donkeys, and they put on the worn-out donkeys some worn-out bags with some worn-out wineskins, and they took their sandals and they distressed them to make it look like they'd long, walked for a long way, and they put on worn-out clothes, and they put some moldy bread in their backpacks, and then they came into the camp of Israel looking all tired and beleaguered, and they introduced themselves as a group of people who come from a far country, but they had heard of the wonderful things that God had done. They were terribly impressed with that. They wanted to enter into a treaty we will be your servants. And Joshua says, well, who are you? And, and so they, they tell the story. And, and when Joshua starts asking questions that are a little bit too concerning for them, they just start pointing to, oh, look, my sandals, they're almost worn. Oh, look, the poor donkey is about to give. Oh, look, the, the, the wineskins are all dried up. I mean, look at the bread, it's moldy. And this is what it says. It said that the nation of Israel tested their provisions but didn't inquire of the Lord. And so they made the treaty. And three days later, they discovered that they weren't a far country. They were 10 miles down the road. And Joshua and Israel were infuriated. And they asked them, why did you do this? And the answer was, we were afraid. And so Joshua does a really interesting thing. He's got to make a decision. Will I keep a promise I made? And he decides that he will do it. And so he's going to keep the treaty with them. And uh, he says, we will not attack you, we will not harm you. Well, when the other five kings heard about this treaty that Gibeon had developed with Israel, it incensed them, and they knew that if other nation states started forming alliances with Israel, they were done. And so they decided they were going to make a statement with Gibeon, and they combined their forces together and attacked one of their own nations. Remember, I talked to you about how unbelievably violent this region of the world was. And if you were weak or you were young, you were at the most risk. They go after Gibeon, which actually was a formidable city. It was both rich, it was defendable, and they had good military. But together with these uh, five kings, Gibeon would be no match for them. And so they sent word to Joshua, and they said, you got to help us out. They're going to kill us. Now, Joshua could have said, Okay, look, it's, it's, it's like this. I made a promise I would not kill you. I didn't make a promise no one else could kill you. <laughs> so, you know. But he doesn't. He honors, this is really fascinating, he honors the spirit of the covenant that he made. And he and the army of Israel marched all night. Uh, let's just kind of unpack this a little bit. Uh, the first thing is this is that when we feel we've made a bad decision, the general tendency is, first of all, to blame others. Israel felt like they made a bad decision, and they want to know what happened, because they have been deceived, and they were deceived. There was information that was misrepresented. Sometimes information is just left out, and so we get really frustrated with people, and we want to know, you know, how could you do this to us? And we kind of blame others. Here's the challenge. Anytime you blame, you should know that it's a way to avoid responsibility it's, it's their fault, so it's their problem. Here's another thing. If you are willing 
to inflict blame on someone, it is highly likely that you are willing to inflict other things on them too. And so our tendency is when we've made a bad decision, let's just check, how many made at least one bad decision in your life? Yeah. Well, let's go for a more honest one. How many is sitting next to someone who made a bad decision at least once in the... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, then, and then we blame ourselves. This is really a, a challenging uh, thing that we do. We tend to blame ourselves, and we beat ourselves up. Oh, I'm such an idiot. I'm, I'm so stupid. I, I should have been paying attention. And, and the more we blame ourselves, the more timid we become about making decisions for ourselves in life. And in fact, it's really fascinating. While we are frustrated with others for what they've done, we're even more frustrated with ourselves, and so we start giving away the right to make decisions for us to others because we would rather feel it's their fault than it's our fault. And so we just start blaming ourselves, and then we blame God. Like, how could he let this happen? Why couldn't the truth have come out? Why didn't he tell me? Why does he seem to favor people who do uh, less um, uh, th things with less integrity? And so people tend to play the blame game. Now, here's the thing that, that's really important for us to understand, right? Blame is a way to avoid responsibility in life. But so is an unwillingness to make or keep promises. In our world, people will do this. They'll, they'll go, well, you know, I'm a person of integrity. And I don't know if I can keep that promise. So I'm not going to make that promise. I mean, if, when you see two people stand with their friends in front of their family and friends and say things like, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, forsaking all others until death, like that, I don't know who put those vows together, but they took out every exception clause there is. <laughs> they were ruthless. It was unbelievable. Like, the, the, it's just unbelievable. And so people will say, well, I don't know if I can keep a promise like that, so I'm going to be a person of integrity and not make a promise like that. Please, we must be careful not to define our fear of making a commitment as an action of integrity. It's not the same thing. When that couple stands together, they're not saying that they've got this all figured out. What they're saying is, no matter what we face, good or bad, We've decided that we will do it together. We will be with each other and we will be for each other, regardless of what we face. And as it turns out, that's a really important thing in life. You know, some people are so afraid of covenants and commitments, they think that it limits their life. And in fact, it's the only thing that releases our life. It's the only thing that makes the world actually work. We have to have these concepts called covenants. So. Israel decided to keep the covenant. They didn't attack them. And like I said, these five kings, they attack Gibeon. Joshua marches all night long and surprises this coalition of kings. They're unprepared for the surprise attack, and some remarkable things start happening. Joshua believed that he would, he believed if he honored his, his covenant, it wouldn't limit God. Just think about that. Keeping my promise doesn't actually limit God. By the way, it doesn't limit you as much as you think either. So what happens is when he honors the covenant, three things occur. And the first is it begins a series of victories. They have an incredible victory against this coalition of five kings and their armies. But if you read on in the rest of that chapter 10 and, and a little bit further, you discover that this was the first of 31 victories in a row. Like imagine the Buffalo Bills winning 31 <laughs> victories in a row. I mean, we won last week. We won last week. <laughs> but it was one win. And this week, I know they can't lose. Because we're on a bye. That's, that's why. It has nothing to do with the schedule or who we're playing. It's, it's a series of victories. That victory occurs when we actually face our challenge and live out our commitments rather than running from them. Uh, second thing is that it made room for a miracle. And this is an astonishing miracle, by the way, and hard to explain. 
And in fact, a lot of modern people really struggle with this particular miracle because what it says is that Joshua stood and commanded the sun to stand still, and it did for about a day. And there, there, the, the modern mind goes, you see, that's the problem with, with Scripture. It's so archaic, so superstitious. Like, we know now the sun doesn't actually revolve around the earth. You know, so... So stand still, how foolish. All right, before we be up on the perspective of people who lived in the ancient world, when the sun broke the horizon uh, this morning, we call that sun, oh, did the sun actually rise? We don't call it earth revolution to increasing light. <laughs> and when the, when the sun disappears beyond the horizon, we call it sun. Oh, so you see, it's very easy to find something that we feel sounds like silliness when in fact we use the exact same language. And here's the problem. So, so what does it mean that the sun stood still? Like, how does that happen? Did the earth actually stop revolving? And the answer is, I don't know. I wasn't there. It sounds to me like the earth not revolving would not be a good thing. But here's our challenge. I don't know what God did. I don't know how he did it. I know that it gave Israel enough time to complete the victory because back in those days, you couldn't fight at night. They, they didn't have special operation military forces that could see as well at night because of technology as they do in the day. If they don't win this battle today, they're going to fight it over and over and over again. And here's our challenge. Will we only believe in a God who can do what we understand in a way that we understand it? And if we do, then we're really deciding to only believe in a God that really isn't that much bigger or better than we are. If God can create the entire universe, is it possible? Anything is possible. And so, do I understand it? I do not. Can I explain it? I cannot. Do I think that God can do something beyond what I can explain? Yes, I do. So there's this concept of miracle. Miracle is a really big deal. By the way, we say we want miracles in life. I want, this is a trick question, so please do not raise your hand. I can say, How many would like to see a miracle today? Oh, that would be nice. We don't really want miracles. We want a life that doesn't need any of them. Oh, I'd love to see a miracle of someone being cured of cancer. Okay. Do you want to be the person with cancer? Well, no. We think that miracles are designed to make life easier. They're not. Miracles are designed to make us stronger and braver. Israel still had to fight the fight. Uh, God did assist them and intervene on their behalf, but they still had to show up. They still had to engage in the fight. So there was room for a miracle because they were willing to keep their covenant. And then the last thing is that it, it expanded their authority. It expanded their authority. Israel began to experience what it was like to meet life head on instead of a nation of slaves with absolutely no authority. Back in Egypt, they were nothing but slaves and all they could do is what they were told. But now they're actually making decisions. The decision to make a covenant was theirs. The decision to keep a covenant was, there, was theirs. The decision to go enforce that covenant was theirs. And they stepped into it. And this is a fascinating thing uh, to me, is that I think a lot of us, uh, uh, let's just check. Is there anybody here that's uh, pretty good in the kitchen? If you bake or cook something, other people tend to like it, okay? So, like, they'll just, they'll just do something. Like, Thanksgiving is coming. Thank God those people are in the kitchen <laughs> because good stuff is going to come out. If I am in the kitchen, we should probably test this product on an animal before we give it to a human. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not sure. If nothing happens to the dog, we'll go forward. And here's the thing. We, oh, that person feels very confident and competent in the kitchen. Another person feels very confident in their mechanical abilities. Another person feels confident in their musical abilities, maybe vocally or instrumental. Another person feels confident. That's great. But in our world, we tend to stick to the tiny little spheres we feel confident in, and that's not the same as having authority. 
A person with authority doesn't just stay where they know they do well. A person with authority is willing to step into an area where things are unknown, but they trust that God is going to help them. And that is an amazing way to live your life. If all you do is just kind of stick to the thing you know is really good, you will feel safe most of the time, and you will feel competent most of the time, but you won't really feel like you have much authority. But when you, when you figure out in life, I don't have to have all the skills to make life work. I'm just willing to keep the promises that I've made to God. And if that takes me to some place that I'm less competent or confident, I'm confident not in myself, but in him, and he will help me. And people who learn that kind of life, they live with a kind of authority that's really impressive to watch. Some of us think that my authority, I, I have a sense of authority from Scripture and from prayer. That's good, but that's not all that we gain our authority from. Our authority comes from Scripture, and our authority comes from prayer, but our authority also comes when we walk a life of faith and we live out the covenant that we have with God. It's a really big deal. So there's this idea of uh, uh, accountability. Now, what's a great example of this? Well, the authority... The great example of this is actually God himself who entered into a covenant with humanity and said, here are the standards by which if you live, you will flourish as human beings. Your society will prosper. Your culture will grow. People will be cared for. It will be unbelievable how good it can be. And then humans, not just one or two, but every one of us has violated that covenant in some way. Every human. And God could have done the blame game and said, I'm done with them. The promise is off, but he doesn't. He sends his son to live out on our behalf the terms of that covenant that we couldn't live for ourselves. And it cost him his life. He lived the death we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. And then he does something that none of us could do on our own, and that is that he comes back to life, and what does he do? He creates a new covenant, an even better covenant. We are all here today because God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. Now, Israel thought that their their covenant was made with a people that was far away. It wound up being uh, a, an all-night march into a battle. And that was their next victory. It was a lot closer than they thought. Now, when someone hears a, a, a talk like this, the tendency is to go, oh, so you're just kind of telling us, just don't be afraid to make a promise and, and live with it. And please, this is not a call to, to foolish decision-making. All right? Do not go out of here today if you are unmarried and find the first single person who will say yes to you and say, well, you married. Don't do that. That will not go as well as you think. It's not about not inquiring of the Lord. We should. It's not about not seeking counsel. We should. It's not about not paying attention to red flags. Sometimes people tell us things about themselves, and we tend to overlook them. And we just hope that's going to improve. It may or may not. This is not a call to foolish decision-making, but it is this understanding that those of us who are willing to make decisions and promises and covenants, we're not always going to get it perfectly right. And in those situations, what God wants us to know is you don't have to recoil in fear and live a, a life where there is no covenant. You can understand this, that the promises you make will actually not limit God from bringing you to the life that he's called you to live. That if you are faithful in the promises you make, that what God does is he gives you a string of victories. He opens up the opportunity for miracles. And your confidence actually begins to soar. That's what God intends for each and every one of us. Let's bow our heads this morning. It, it really is, it's a better way to live than just convenience, because we can do that. I only do what's easy, or commodity. I'll do what I can afford. 
or covenant. And as it turns out, you know this is true, right? You know it's true. Covenant is what makes the world work. That whether it's a covenant between a man and a woman to spend the rest of their lives supporting each other and trying to build a life that matters, or it's a covenant of a government that promises it will protect and defend its citizens, or the covenant of individuals who serve to make sure that our country is able to keep those covenants, that at the end of the day, it's covenants that makes our world work. And every time they're broken, we are too. So Father, I ask that you would help us today. We don't have enough strength on our own. We don't have enough wisdom or information. And the tendency is, is to withdraw out of fear, to hold back from being a promise-making people. Our, our tendency is to blame others when things don't go right and look for ways out. Would you help us today to understand that as best we can, if we seek to honor the commitments that we've made to you and others, that you will find a way to work in them, to set us up for a series of things that will feel like victories and interactions with you that will go beyond our abilities and that at the end we won't feel used at all, we'll feel strong. Would you help us with that today in Jesus' name? Amen. Let's all stand together.